Hello everyone. This video is about entanglement, the EPR paradox and the Bell inequality. If you follow the video up to the end, you will understand entanglement, how to construct operators for composite systems, the singlet state, the EPR paradox, why quantum mechanics is still compatible with special relativity, the classical version of the Bell inequality, the Bell inequality for the two half spin particles system, the violation of the inequality and something on the experimental results. If you already know all of this, I hope the video will be useful to you anyway. For classical systems, the state of a composite system is the Cartesian product of the states of the components. You just put side to side the component states and they do not mix each other. For quantum systems, the state of a composite system is the tensor product of the states of the components. The component states get mixed up each other and it is this feature of quantum mechanics that leads eventually to entanglement. The state of a half-spin particle system is given by the linear combination of two orthogonal basis vectors. In our case, we will use spin up and spin down as a basis. It takes two complex numbers to fully define the state of this system, and therefore the half-spin particle state is an element of a two-dimensional Hilbert space over the complex numbers. Each basis vector of the two particles composed system is the tensor product of two basis vectors, one from each component. In our case, the state of the composite system is given by the following four basis vectors. Up up, up down, down up, and down down. It takes four complex numbers to fully define the state of this system and therefore the composite systems as dimension four over the complex numbers. To define the state of one half spin particle, you need two degrees of freedom, because it takes four real numbers for the two complex components of the state, minus one degree of freedom because we want the state to be normalized to one, and minus one degree of freedom because two states that differ only by a phase, define the same state. To define the composite state of two one-half spin particles, you need six degrees of freedom, because it takes eight real numbers for the four complex components of the state minus two degrees of freedom, for the same reason of the previous case. The component system has two more degrees of freedom of the two separate states put together. It means that we can store more information in it. This is a first clue of entanglement. This has consequences. One important consequence is that while it is always possible to combine states, it is not always possible to factorize a state in its components. For example, for this state, which is called the singlet state, using the fact that the state should be normalized to 1, we find that the component should satisfy the equation AC square plus BD square equals 0, which is impossible. This state cannot be factorized and therefore it is an entangled state. The Hermitian operators, associated to three orthogonal axes, are the S matrices. They are proportional to the sigma matrices. In this video we will use the sigma matrices for calculations. They have the same eigenvectors of the S matrices, and their eigenvalues differ by a factor of one half h bar from the ones of the S matrices. They are much easier to handle for calculations but, bear in mind, we need to put the one half h bar factor back when it comes to the result of a measurement. Once you know how an operator acts on the basis vectors, you know everything about it. This is because of the definition itself of matrix representation of linear operators, which is given by this equation, where bj and bk are two basis vectors, and sigma jk is the relevant element in the matrix representation of sigma. For example, suppose we do not know the sigma matrices but we know how they act on the basis vectors. Suppose we want to know the 1-2 element of the sigma y matrix. In this case, bj is the vector basis 1 which is the up state, bk is the vector basis 2 which is the down state. Now, when sigma y acts on the down state, it gives minus i times the up state. And we get as expected the 1 2 element of the sigma y matrix. Now we can use what just we learned on operator representation, to work out the operators for the composite system. We will call sigma the operators acting on the first particle, and tau the operators acting on the second particle. Since we know how an operator acts on a vector basis of a particle, we know also how it acts on a vector basis of the composite systems. It does the same thing to that particle, and it leaves the other particle unchanged. Note that, with abuse of notation, we have used the same symbol for the operator acting on one particle and the one acting on the composite system, because they do exactly the same thing. However, they are completely different operators, represented by different matrices, and acting on different spaces. We are now able to work out how our operators act on each single basis vector of the composite state. 
And we are also able to work out the operator for a measurement involving two different operators acting on the two particles by applying both operators to a vector basis. Note that we can act with sigma and tau in any order because the two operators acting on different parts of a system commute as you can easily check. I will give you now the quickest way to calculate operators acting on composite systems. If you have an operator alpha relevant to a measurement on the first particle, and an operator beta relevant to a measurement on the second particle, the operator relevant to the resulting measurement on the composite system is simply the Kronecker product of the matrix representation of the two operators. Note that, although the same symbol is used, the Kronecker product among matrices has not to be confused with the tensor product. They are two different things. In this example, we calculated the operator sigma z acting on the composite system. Note that we have used the identity operator on the second system which is the operator acting on the system without changing it. You can check that using the two methods, for calculating operators acting on composite systems, you get the same result. We want to talk a bit about the singlet state, which is a very important state for many reasons. First of all the singlet state is the lowest energy status for the system. When two particles get close enough, after a while, they interact and go to the singlet state. This is the way systems get entangled. They just interact each other. Moreover, if we evaluate the expectation value of sigma x, we get zero. You know now how to evaluate this quantity because you know how sigma x acts on the basis vectors. The same is true with sigma y and z. This is a new thing and a new clue that two entangled particles form a system with new characteristics. This is because you cannot have the same thing with a system of non-entangled particles. Note that, there is thing special with the x, y, and z directions. Given any unit vector n, if we evaluate the operators sigma n, and tau n, relevant to the measurement of the spin along the n-axis, we find that the expectation values of these operators are all zero. So far, we have talked only of the singlet state. Of course there are infinite many other entangled states. One of them is the triplet state, which is the superposition of the same basis vectors as for the singlet state, but this time with a plus sign. For the triplet state it is still true that the expectation value of the sigma and tau operators is zero, as it was for the singlet state. However, a big difference comes when we evaluate the expectation value of the sum of sigma and tau along any axis. For the singlet state, we get a zero expectation value also in this case. We say that we have a total spin equal to zero. This means that the singlet state is invariant under rotations. You can rotate the system in space, as much as you want, you get always the same state back. This is a remarkable feature of the singlet state that make it ideal for some experiments. For the triplet state, we get zero along the x and y axis and two along the z axis. If we reintroduce the one half h bar factor in measurement, from the s matrices, we get a total spin along the z axis of one. The triplet state is not invariant under rotations. In 1935, Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen wrote an article in which argued that the description of physical reality provided by quantum mechanics is incomplete. In the paper they proposed a thought experiment involving a pair of particles in an entangled state. The original argument for the EPR paradox was based on particles position and velocity. We will use spin of particles, which does not change the nature of the discussion. The main point in the EPR paradox is that, if we measure spin along z of particle A and we find it z up, we immediately know particle B is in the state is z down. Then, if we measure spin along x of particle B and we find it's x up, we immediately know particle A is spin is in status x down. In this way, we know the of both particles along the z and x axis, which are incompatible observable. Since no faster than light signal may have been traveled between the particles, we may conclude that the particles must have a definite value of both position and of momentum before the measurement. This is the theory of hidden variables. Einstein was concerned with the non-locality nature of quantum theory. When a system is composed by two entangled parts which are far apart, a measurement on the part of the system that makes the wave function to collapse will change instantaneously the state of the other part. However, Suppose we have a collections of pairs of particles entangles to each other and taken far apart. No experiment on the particle in one part can change the statistics on the measurements of the other part. This does not allow faster than light communications. Although non-locality is intrinsic in quantum mechanics, the non-faster than light communication restores causality. No event can influence another event which is outside its light cone and special relativity is safe. Before we derive the Bell inequality, we need to prove a little theorem on classical objects. 
Suppose we have a collection of objects, which can have any of three independent properties. Property A, B and C. We can draw a diagram. First we draw the set of all objects that have property A. Then, the set all the object that have property B. And finally, the set of all objects that have property C. In each region of the diagram we have a set of objects having different combinations of properties. Some of this set may be the empty set. We label some of this set with Greek letters. We want to prove that the number of objects having property A, and not having property B which is the union of set alpha and delta, plus the number of objects having property B, and not having property C, which is the union of set beta and epsilon, is greater or equal to the number of objects having property A, and not having property C which is the union of set alpha and epsilon. Well, the proof is quite easy. We remove the number of objects in the set that are common to both sides of the inequality, and we are left with the statement that the number of objects in delta, plus the number of objects in beta, is equal or greater than zero. Which is obviously true. We get eventually an inequality valid for classical objects. We are now ready to derive the Bell inequality. There are many versions of the inequality. We will derive the simplest one. Suppose we have a collection of paired particles in the singlet state. This pairs are the objects to which apply the inequality we just proved. In our case the inequality, in terms of number of objects, translate immediately to probability because we can perform many experiments and do the statistics. We define property A, to be particle 1, in the status up along the z-axis. We define property B, to be particle 1, in the status up along the axis at 45 degrees on the xz plane. We define property C, to be particle 1, in the status up along the x-axis. We define property not B, to be particle 1, in the status down along the axis at 45 degrees on the xz plane, and therefore particle 2 to be in the status up, along the same axis, because the two particle are in the singlet state. Finally, we define property not C, to be particle 1, in the status down along the x-axis, and therefore particle 2 to be in the status up, along the same axis. Given the inequality from our little theorem, we have immediately an inequality in terms of probability of measurements on the particles. Now, we know that the probability to have particle 1 up along Z and particle 2 to be up along the 45 degrees axis is the same as the probability to have particle 1 up along the 45 degrees axis and particle 2 to be up along X. This is because the singlet state is invariant under rotations. This gives eventually the famous Bell inequality. We want to evaluate the inequality for our system and we need to clarify a few things. First of all, we need to use projector operators. This is because, if a system is in the state psi, the probability to find the state of the system in a subspace spanned by a subset of eigenvalues phi i, is given by the expected value of the projector operator relevant to that subspace. This comes from the postulates of quantum mechanics. Then, we need to evaluate the operator associated to a measurement along the 45 degrees axis in the xy plane. This is given by a linear combination of the sigma matrices with coefficients from the unit vector of that axis. The same applies to the tau matrices on the second particles. Next, we should know that the projector operator for the up status of an observable associated to a sigma matrix is given by the sigma matrix plus the identity divided by 2. This is because, this operator picks up the up status of a wave function and removes the down state. You can check this yourself easily. The same applies to the tau matrices on the second particles. Finally, we need to know that the projector operator for simultaneous measurement on the two particles is given by the product of the projector operators for the two single measurements. This is because the two measurements are compatible and the two projector operator commutes. You can check this yourself easily. We can now calculate the probabilities. We start from the left-hand side of the inequality. We write the expectation value of the projector operator, which is composed of the product of the projector operators of the two separate measurements on the two particles. We use the definition of sigma along the 45 degree axis on the xy plane, and we do a bit of algebra. We get several terms. Some give no contribution. For example, we have already shown that terms like tau z, sigma z, and tau x, have zero expectation value. Also the term tau z, tau x gives zero contribution. This is not too difficult to see. The identity matrix and the term sigma z tau z have expectation value of 1 and minus 1. However, since we have pulled out the 1 over square root of 2 from the singlet states, when multiplied with the non-normalized vectors, 
they give 2 and minus 2. The calculation of the probability for the right-hand side is very similar. Once again we need to write the expression for the projector operator and evaluate the expectation value. After a bit of algebra, we get several terms. Less than before, and we already know what contribution they give from the previous case. In this case the only term that gives a contribution is the identity matrix, when multiplied with the non-normalized vectors it's a factor of 2. Give the factor of 1 8 in front of the equation, we get a final result of 1 4. We are now ready to plug the values we have found in the inequality. We find that, for a system of entangled particles in a singlet state, the inequality is violated. If our pairs of particles were classical objects, the inequality would not have been violated, but they are not. If this result can be proved experimentally, it means that there is no classical mechanism that can reproduce the results of quantum mechanics. The theory of hidden variables can be ruled out. In 1972 John Clauser and Stuart Friedman, using photons, performed the first experiments proving that the Bell inequality is violated. In the following years other research teams lead by Aspect First, and then Zeilinger, confirmed the results. In 2022, Aspect, Clauser and Zeilinger, were awarded the Nobel Prize for proving that the Bell inequality is violated. Einstein was wrong and quantum mechanics is safe. Thanks for watching.